comes a bad influence. As you can see, we've got some friends round for our Christmas party! Hooray! But the bad news is, unfortunately, this is the last bad influence in the present series. Aww. The good news is we're looking at all the good stuff that's coming out in the new year, including a look at one of the first 3DOs in the country. Is this the console that's going to take over the world? Our main review is Super Empire Strikes Back on the SNES. And Z-Wright visits the future where three-dimensional television and violins that sound like entire orchestras are just around the corner. But first, have a look at this. It's the intro sequence to a new beat-em-up called Rise of the Robots. You control a cyborg who's been sent into a robot research laboratory where, apparently, all the robots have contracted a violent virus and are killing off all the humans. Nowadays, making a game like Rise of the Robots can be more like producing a movie than writing a computer programme. They even use movie-style storyboards. For example, here's the storyboard for the intro sequence you've just seen from Rise of the Robots. And there's a spaceship going into the building. And over here's the robot coming through the light. The game started life about two years ago as a set of ideas banded about between artists and programmers. And then somebody decided to put all those ideas down on paper and came up with this, the so-called games design document. This is like your instruction book and some. It's got all the information on the game, all the pathways through the levels, pictures of the backgrounds, pictures of some of the robots. It's all in here. But nobody went near a computer until the artists actually finally started to design the main characters. And they start out life like this, as kind of skeletons, wireframe models. And if I change our viewpoint, you might get a better idea of what this one is. Still not very clear, though, is it? What you need to do is add a bit of texture to this model. Now you can see that it's um, a robot with an ape-like head. The next stage, of course, is to animate the models, and to do that, they use a program called a keyframer. The models are represented initially by boxes, so you can quickly get a sense of how they're going to move. The interesting thing is, is that in this sequence, only the white lines were done by the artist. The initial frame and the end frame, and all the black lines were done by the computer. The computer's done all the in-between moves, and the only time the artist had to tweak it is here, where the computer didn't quite get the position of the model just right. Two other interesting facts about the game are the first is that the backgrounds were designed by a professional interior designer, and secondly, you can't just bash the same old buttons again and again to win, because the computer will suss you out. You see, the computer-controlled robot's opponents will sort of watch the way you fight and remember it, and then they'll adjust their tactics to cut through your defences. Cunning. After all this, the final element to add to the game is a sample of sound effects and music, and then there you have it. Two years' work, cut down into three minutes. Christmas bells, ding dong, ding dong. Christmas bells are in my song. <laughs> ah, hello, festive furtlers. <laughs> I'm dead excited because I'm preparing for the best Christmas party this year. Hey! <laughs> All my friends are coming, and Spiky, and Flash, and Cuddles, and even Andy and Violet, too. Right, I've not got much time, so here's a quick cheat for Super Tennis on the SNES. First of all, select your player, and then get Controller 2, and press L five times, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and X, and then R seven times, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and finally X again, and wait for the music to change and your player will become an instant top seed. Brilliant. And now, for the first of my guides to a better Christmas. How to eat chocolates off the Christmas tree without anybody knowing. First of all, carefully unwrap the chocolate, eat it, and then wrap it up again and hang it on the tree. Perfect. So that's why he's so spotty. Our main review this week is Super Empire Strikes Back on the snares, the follow-up to last year's amazingly successful Super Star Wars. The new game is a 12-meg cartridge with some spectacular Mode 7 graphics. There are 14 levels representing all the best bits from the film. You even get to fly in the Millennium Falcon through an asteroid field with Princess Leia at your side. As in the original game, you start as Luke Skywalker, complete with lightsaber, but you can change to playing Han Solo or Chewie on later levels. Here's Han in the freezing chamber. Watch out for those carbons. You're going to need skill, courage and all the force you can muster. Here's Alex. This is a major improvement on Super Star Wars. The only problem is that the first couple of levels are a bit too hard, but persevere because there's some great bits later on. This is my favourite bit from the film. I'm in the snow speed and what I've got to do is bring down those at-ats. If you press left and right, then you can flick out a rope and get it round the legs of the at-at. Then you've got to spin round. These graphics are excellent. It uses Mode 7 and the sound's a vast improvement on the first game. I've brought him down. Here I am on the Dago Bar Forest level. I've just met Yoda, so I've earned the force. I've got loads of different powers, but what I need now is elevation. This will help me get up onto this top platform. 
There's loads more forces, including heal, which helps you when your energy's a bit low, and invisible, which really helps when you're fighting Darth Vader at the end. This game is near perfect. I just couldn't stop playing it till I finished it. It's magnificent. This is fantastic. It's the best film conversion I've ever played. It's a massive game with excellent graphics and gameplay. And so the final score for Super Empire Strikes Back, both the girls and the boys gave it top marks, five out of five. In his final report from the States, Z. Wright has been to visit the Media Lab, part of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in Boston, normally called MIT. It's a place where the future is just a train ride away. Hi, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology is so famous that it has its own subway station dedicated to it, with some really cool exhibits right in the middle of the track. I'm here to visit the Media Lab which is the part of the institute where art and science mix. I have a feeling I'm about to take a walk on the wild side. Down here is the holography lab where they're working on the leading edge. These are some experimental holographic animations. Very few people in the world have ever seen moving holograms like these. They were made by using three beams of laser light, red, blue, and green. One of the biggest computers in the world is needed to compute the vast amount of information in this cubic image. And by using these controls, I can move it around interactively. We're hoping that we're in the same age that television displays were in in the 1930s. And therefore, in the next 50 years, we'll be able to show some great improvements in holographic displays. In the visual language workshop, students are working on software that can change the viewer's focus from one thing to another. They can do interesting things with layers of text and even play around with it. On this map, which looks very confusing with all the information on show, they can shift the focus to just highlight one or two features. This software can also be used in animation, an effect which would otherwise be difficult to achieve. These little boxes are the product of another piece of software called the Video Streamer. And this represents a piece of movie. I love sending personal messages. The technique was created by Professor Gloriana Davenport. Here, all the clips of the movie that have been shot for a film can be easily selected and edited together like a moving card index. Just choose any bit of film in the streamer, and it'll play out frame by frame along the bottom of the screen. You can turn on the soundtrack to get the edit exact. It's a really quick and flexible way to edit a story. Just down the hall, they're doing some strange things with music. Very fast, change of the bow and do a little tremolo. This is a hyper violin invented by Professor Todd McCulloch. The computer already knows the piece of music, and so the bow acts like the conductor's baton. So we want to measure lots of things about the way you're playing, um, how loud and how soft. The computer knows what's being played because of special uh, transmitters built into each end of the bow and connected by a metal strip. Their signal is picked up by a receiver built into the violin. The computer can then map exactly the position of the bow and produce a visual readout on this monitor. The hyper violin is designed to be used only by virtuoso musicians. The team here have also developed a drum boy using a keyboard fitted with its own computer. <laughs> Yo, I think this could start a whole new career. <laughs> to Nam, happy Christmas, love Spikey. Uh, that's nice. <laughs> P.S. I won't be able to make the party. I've got to do something. Oh. Oh, well, uh, all the more cake for everyone else. <laughs> now time for part two of my guide to a better Christmas. Your presents are most likely to be hidden in number one, the spare room wardrobe, and uh, number two, the cardboard box under your mum's bed, or number three, in the chest of drawers next to the front door. Right, uh, this is a Christmas cheat for Megalomania on the Mega Drive. On the password screen, simply type in jewels, like so, and when you start to play, you'll get a secret hidden game that's like the classic arcade game, Asteroids. Brilliant. Oh, excuse me. Um, yes, yes. Oh, look, it's another Christmas card. Hey. Oh, oh. 
Ah, oh, it's from Cuddles and Flash. We've got to do something too. Oh. Oh well. It's just uh, me, Andy and Violet then. I'm not going to Nam's party, are you? Nah, I'm going to stay in and dye my hair a funny colour. So she already had. As this is the last in the present series, we've decided to devote the entire news and preview section to showing you everything that's going to be happening in the new year. But can we fit it in in the time? Here goes. No games round that would be complete without a beat-em-up. Apart from Rise of the Robots, the other big one coming out next year is Eternal Champions on the Mega Drive. It aims to better Street Fighter 2, it's due out in the spring, and it features the greatest fighters of all eternity coming together for one last grand tournament. Shoot 'em ups will be coming fast and furious next year. This is our type 3 on the SNES. No prizes for guessing what this is the sequel to. All the weapons have been beefed up to include laser blasts galore, remote robotic cannon pods, and a choice of three different droid blasters at the beginning. Inferno on the PC and Amiga 1200 isn't just another shoot 'em up, it's also a massive space odyssey. You've got to hurtle around an entire solar system battling to survive against over 300 heavily armoured death craft. Grand Zero Texas on the Mega CD is a good example of the way games and films are coming closer and closer together. It features three million dollars worth of footage shot exclusively for the game. You play an undercover agent investigating strange disappearances in a small Texas town, and before you know it, you're fighting a full-scale alien invasion. The game producers reckon it's the best Mega CD game ever, but then they would, wouldn't they? On to adventure games. This is the stunning Alone in the Dark 2, which finally hits the shops in January. It's only available on PC, but then it needs all the power it can get to produce the incredible graphics. As before, you can watch the action from different camera angles, and you have to cope with all sorts of devious puzzles, traps and plot twists. Another epic adventure on the PC is Stone Keep, starring 3D characters and backgrounds with 14 different locations. As with many of these big games nowadays, there's digitised movie footage. And finally in the adventure section, there's Young Merlin for the SNES. It's got ten lands, loads of animation and digitised speech. The plot? Well, it's the usual stuff. Merlin must outwit the King's army and battle assorted evil geezers. Blah, blah, blah. Onward, onward, onward. Times are pressing. The next section are Sims, and this is the amazing Star Wars Space Sim Rebel Assault. The graphics are really film-like, and the characters even speak to you as you blow up walkers and take on Star Destroyers to fend off the advances of the evil empire. It's out now on PC CD-ROM, and it's coming out on Mega CD next year. This one's a pinball sim. It's Dragon's Revenge for the Mega Drive, the sequel to the excellent Dragon's Fury. It's got bigger tables, more music, and it's out in January. This watch is excellent, not because you can tell the time on it, but because it's also a tiny TV and video remote control. So you can switch off people's televisions. You can sneak around furtively just going, oh, sorry about that one. Oh, sorry about that one. And then you won't lose it behind the back of the sofa when it's time to switch on for bad influence. Boink. After that brief interruption for gadget fans, have a look at rock and roll racing on the SNES. As well as being a fast and furious, laser-firing, bullet-biting road race, it features some great rock and roll tracks from bands like Black Sabbath and Steppenwolf. And so to platform games, that funky duo Toe Jam and Earl return for another adventure on the Mega Drive. This second game finds them hunting stowaway earthlings on the planet Funkatron. Jungle Book, also on the Mega Drive, should have hit the shops for Christmas, but due to programming problems, it won't be out till June. This is an early version, but it's looking like it's going to be well worth the wait. I'm afraid that's all we've got time for. Now for some reviews of this week's games. Micro Machines was the number one hit on the Mega Drive. Now it's out on four new formats. Amiga, which you're looking at now, PC, Master System and Game Gear. In the wacky miniature world of Micro Machines, races take place on breakfast tables, in sand pits and even in the bathtub. So let's make it a nice clean race. Here's Amanda with the Game Gear version. I've played this game on other systems, but I think it works better on the Game Gear. Probably because it feels like you've got a wheel in your hand. This is where you choose the characters. Every character has a different personality and different driving ability. I'll choose to be Spider. I think he's really cool. Every level has a different car. Here I'm in a Porsche and I'm on a desktop. It's very hard on the desktop because there's no edges and you can fall off or knock people off. But I've just fallen off myself. So the cars are very hard to control, so the level is very hard indeed. But the graphics are excellent for a game gear. Just look at the detail in the wood grain. There is a two-player option, which you play on just the one Game Gear, which is definitely cosy. I'm using the buttons, and Alex is using the D-pad. The idea of the game is to get away from the other player, and then if that person gets the bonus. If you've got a Game Gear, you should definitely get this. It's brilliant fun. An excellent game, particularly in two-player mode, although it depends who you've got to sit close to. I found 
found this game quite hard to control at first, but it's very playable once you get the hang of it. And the scores for Micro Machines, both the boys and the girls, gave it an above average four out of five. Meet the Cyberpunks, three little chaps with funny haircuts who are the stars of a new Amiga game. It's a familiar plot. Baddies have taken over the universe, again, and you've got to restore order by shooting lots of things. Here's the catch. There's a lot of time and effort being put into this game, but the producers forgot to add one thing, gameplay. The aim of this game is to find keys and disks, which allow you to go into computer terminals and discover maps of the area. The characters are quite cute, and the graphics are OK. But the problem with the game is that you feel it's quite a laborious task. You don't enjoy it. There's not much excitement. It's not the worst game in the world. It's just mind-numbingly boring. I love the hairstyles, but I don't like anything else about it. A run-of-the-mill platform game. The gameplay is just not varied enough. And the scores for Cyberpunks, both the girls and the boys, gave it a dull two out of five. And now a look at what some people think will be the future of Games Console's 3DO. If you're not familiar with the system, it's a CD-based machine. It'll play photo CDs, music CDs, and soon you'll be able to get movies on CD for it too. But it's really catching people's imagination as a sophisticated games console. It's recently been launched in America where it comes with a racing game called Crash and Burn. You choose between six dangerous Sunday drivers and race around some very detailed texture map tracks. There's a choice of weapons, armor and gadgets to keep you in the race, and the game has some excellent video footage and speech effects. There are very few finished games around for it at the moment, but here's a quick look at a couple we managed to get hold of. It's time to get twisted with your host, Twink Fizzdale. <laughs> this one's called Twisted. It's an unusual idea for a game. You join Twink Fizzdale and his glamorous assistant, Hannah, in one of Hollywood's glitziest game shows. You're up against six other strange contestants, and there are thousands of brain-busting challenges. Put on your thinking cap, kids. Hi, everyone. Welcome to John Madden Football. John Madden Football has been converted from the Mega Drive and makes full use of the 3DO's facilities, with digitised players and stadiums and ball by ball commentary and tips from the great man himself. The system's due to be launched in this country next April. It will probably cost around £500, which is a lot for a games console, but the manufacturers are hoping that you will buy this instead of buying a photo CD and a CD player as well. We'll report on 3DO's progress next year. Well, Andy and Violet have obviously been delayed a little. <laughs> Still, there's time to do one more cheat before the shed fills up with happy partying dudes. It's for Sleepwalker on the Amiga. Now, at the beginning of the game, when Ralph and Lee are running through the Sleepwalker logo, type in Dinger Ding, Dang My Danger Long Ling Long, and their noses will turn green. Then, at any point during the game, you can press return and skip levels. <laughs> Well, here's the final part of my guide to a better Christmas. On Christmas Eve, it's always dead difficult to get to sleep, so this is a trick that sometimes works. Uh, here we go. Uh, 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 mm, mm. Ah, uh, Ovaltine. <laughs> and now, to get to sleep. <laughs> Don't try that at home. Nam has been specially trained. If you want to read the date of last, set your video recorder going now. Last week's competition was to win a 3DO with some games, and the competition question was, what does R-I-S-C stand for, as in the risk chip that's inside a 3DO? Runners-up will get Bad Influence T-shirts. Your names are going across the screen now. Well done. The answer was reduced instruction set chip. And the winner, Gareth Williams from Hemel Hempstead. Well done. This is the last show, so there's no competition. If 3D only we could stay longer, but it's a Nintendo series. But I'm eager to make another series. And you will do, but not until the autumn. Until then, we have the Sega. Bye. All right, then. Tatari. Peace in ya. Bye! Happy Christmas, fertilers.